So uh, I'm going to tell you a tale of many banks, of many APIs, lots of standards, so, so many standards, and a requirement to comply with them. Um, so it, this is going to focus a lot on open banking in Europe. Um, in particular, what's coming out of PSD2, but in particular on that, what's happening in the UK, which is covered by the PSD2 regulations. So, yeah, please, please just don't talk about it. Um, I actually am becoming an American next Monday because I'm so depressed by it. That is true. Um, so, PSD2 is a set of payment regulations based on, uh, essentially based on APIs that all of the countries of Europe are signing up to. One of the interesting things about it is, is the European Commission, in its wisdom, has decided that they won't necessarily define what the standards are, they leave that to the countries involved. And inside each of the countries, the countries have decided that they will then have different regulators working on different pieces. So I'm going to focus on the UK for a bit, because they're actually further ahead than many countries. But in the UK, they have, if you go down the right-hand side, the OBIE, the uh, Open Banking Implementation Entity, who are defining the API standards. You have the CMA9 regulations, which are the government regulations which define which bank should be they should be applied to. You have the Financial Conduct Authority, which is a overseeing regulatory body. You have the Payment Services Regulator, who is another regulating body. And then, when there are disputes, you have the Internet Conduct Office, who do default resolution, do, uh, dispute resolution. So, with all of the different APIs, there's actually quite a complex structure of who is responsible for what. And this is just one country. If these banks start to operate across different, different borders, you can have this replicated in 27 different countries. And that's before, before we start to talk about the world open banking regulations. But I'm going to stick with the UK for now. So UK banking uh, is an interesting set of banks in there. Um, so some very old UK banks, Barclays, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland is technically a UK bank. Lloyd's. Danske actually is a UK bank for the purposes of UK regulations. Uh, so is Bank of Ireland. So is the Allied Irish Bank. Um, it's banks that do business in there. One of the larger banks in the UK now is also Santander, which is actually a Spanish bank. So you've got lots of banks having operating companies covered by regulations that are separate to regulations they look after elsewhere. Let me know if you're losing this, because I often do. So, within the UK, the o Open Banking Implementation Agency has defined a set of APIs every bank has to have. These cover data they must supply to the open market via API, and read-write services that must be available to third-party payment providers, to account information service providers, and others. So, what they have defined is requirements for time to first byte, i.e. latency, the availability, which we will talk about, compliance to the specification, and delivery against those specifications. So, if you're a bank operating in the UK, you actually have to think about how you prove to a third party in the event of a dispute, or even without a dispute, how those things are going to, uh, how you actually comply to those things. Which means people are hang having to start to think about how you measure them and what measuring these things means. So, going back to uh, some topics from the previous talk, actually, um, things you can measure with API calls, HTTP code, pretty straightforward. Latency, the content that comes back, and the pass rate. But that all opens up a series of interesting questions for us. So, is the HTTP code the right code, and does it actually make sense in the context of what came back? If you're measuring latency, what are you measuring latency from? Are you measuring latency inside your infrastructure? If so, where inside your infrastructure are you measuring it? Or are you measuring it from where the TPPs might be? And there's actually flame wars going on on LinkedIn at the moment between representatives of the open banking implementation entity and representatives from third-party payment providers over who is telling the truth. The OBIE are publishing one set of numbers some of the TPPs are measuring different numbers, and uh, 
The truth actually probably lies in the middle, but there's quite a big discrepancy between the two. With the content, um, there's lots of questions about what you're actually providing, how you're providing it, and whether it's what people wanted. And I'll come on to that in a bit more detail. And then finally, pass rates. What is a pass rate, and what does that mean for availability? And that's not a very easy question to answer, no matter how simple it sounds. So I'm going to break things down a bit and take a little detour into my day job, which is we run an API monitoring company, or I run an API monitoring company. But these are things that uh, we've been worrying about now for about three years with APIs. So HTTP codes. Um, first mistake people make, HTTP 200, it's all OK. Uh, I've been making fun of RunScope for four years now on that one. I will continue to do so, even though CA own them. It's not necessarily a good thing to do, especially with banks. One of the problems with the banking community is it's very old. They have infrastructure dating back to, um, in some cases, we've seen the 1980s. And these pieces don't talk very well to each other. You'll have a gateway which is delivering REST. Behind that, you'll, it'll talk to something delivering SOAP. Behind that, it'll talk to something older than SOAP. And beyond that, in some cases, it will talk to a mainframe that predates SOA as an architecture. Um, what we tend to see then is you get lots of bits that don't talk to each other well and errors filter up. But because there are so many errors, going to one of the points made in the previous talk, people filter them out of New Relic and AppDynamics and other, the other stack monitoring tools. So the only way to actually see them is to measure what the end user experience is. So we see a lot of 400 errors that are actually quite catastrophic internal failures of systems that got completely missed by everything. Next one is, where do you measure from and what are you doing with it? These are two identical APIs from two different organizations. One took nearly, takes nearly a second on average, one just over half a second. As you may notice, the gray stuff is all networking effects when the call is made from an clou external cloud service. Different services have different networking components, and I'll drill into that in a, different, in a little bit. But what we have found is there is a very big conflict of interactivity between banking security on their networks and how the public cloud behaves. And this can add, in some cases, seconds of delay depending on which cloud host you prov provider you pick and where in the world they are. Um, this is an example of the same call made from different data centers around Europe um, just on average. So Finland, uh, Google, 500 milliseconds or UK around 200 milliseconds. This varies by API, this varies by bank. Um, we're still waiting to hear back from Google why the Finland data center is so bad. Rumor has it it's because they have extra layers of security to deal with who their neighbors are. Um, I'm not sure about that yet, but no one's confirmed or denied it. So going back to the UK sample, um, what we have in the UK is a very interesting experiment in making large companies do the same thing over and over again. So within the OBIE, there are uh, a number of banks offering exactly the same APIs, doing exactly the same things to the same specifications in exactly the same way. So this gives us um, all the same data, and it gives us a standard for measuring against. And we've, we can, as we can access those as an external entity, we've been able to build up quite a good statistical model of what's going on. And, what it can possibly tell us. Um, there's some drawbacks on these. These are very simple APIs. It's a simple get request. You could put it in your browser and get JSON back. There's no security on them. Uh, there is an argument that it tells you really nothing. But that's where it gets interesting for me, because uh, we made an assumption. Uh, I'm not sure uh, this is uh, something people say in America. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it. But there is a saying about ass assuming things, in that it makes an ass out of you and me. So. We made the assumption that these are big banks. They have lots of IT people. They know what they're doing. It couldn't possibly be that they wouldn't be able to do something as simple as deliver via API a list of all of their ATM locations in a consistent way. I was wrong. So we, uh, we score the APIs based on different metrics in a standardized way. We're fairly confident of our structure. It's like a credit score. If it's out, of, it's out of 999, the closer to 999 it is, the closer to perfect. The lower it gets, the worse it is. 
We assumed everybody should be able to maintain a score in the 900s. These are really simple APIs. I can't stress that enough. But what we found is month to month, week to week, the banks could not consistently deliver a standardized experience, even on these simple ones, which says to us, with payment APIs and other APIs, they will be struggling too. And yet, when they're reporting it to the regulators, they're reporting everything's working fine and the pass rates are good and the latencies are low. So there is a discrepancy between what they're reporting and what their DevOps teams were monitoring and what you actually experience if you measure externally. So we then dive into the speed. These are all the same API call. Um, it's to get, AP, get, get ATMs uh, for some of the biggest banks in the UK. Uh, if you can't read, actually, I think you can. If you can't, can't read it, the scale is milliseconds on the left-hand side. So uh, Barclays, being the slowest, is peaking at three seconds per call on average. Uh, the fastest ones are about a quarter of a second. This is the end-to-end -end journey time, so this includes the DNS lookup, the networking, and everything else. So we looked at that and thought, well, maybe there's some difference between what they're returning, because obviously the more you return, the slower it should be. So we mapped it to the content returned. And while there was a correlation, there was also some interesting stuff emerged in terms of compliance. Yes, Barclays are returning more, but they're returning less than Santander, who's nearly twice as fast. But then we started looking at the return JSON, because we're thinking, hang on a second. Barclays Santander have quite large branch networks, but they're no different to NatWest, which is a national UK bank with thousands of, a thousand odd branches. Turned out NatWest had looked at the OBI specification and read it completely differently to the other banks. So while the other banks had had the fields in for things like disability access, opening times, um, you know, what currencies they could support, NatWest put those fields in but didn't populate them. So they were returning. Um, uh, the scale is about two megabytes at the, on the side where Santander are. So basically, the NatWest packet is not, it's not compressed in any way. It's just really small, because all it returns is a single line with an address. So question that we've sent back to the regulator is, well, who's, who's compliant or not? And the regulator hadn't noticed. So. Coming back to my point, you have to look at the packets, you have to look at the content return, and then you have to decide what that's actually going to mean for the people of your audience and how you're going to prove it to someone. Because the other piece you're meant to do is be able to prove that you are consistently returning the number of branches, the number of ATMs, and the number of items in the JSON packet on a regular basis. And there's a question of how you do that too. So we're now going to talk about a little bit about some of those networking things we mentioned. This is purely DNS lookup time from public cloud locations for that API. Um, so it's broken down by countries and different clouds. Uh, you'll notice IBM at the end there, there's no, uh, you can't see the bar. That's not because there was no data, that's because it's too short to see. Uh, they've got almost zero, from the UK, IBM's uh, data center has an almost zero DNS lookup time on average. Whereas if you call these, make the same call from AWS France, it's doing a complete retry pretty much every time. That's a 500 millisecond average DNS lookup time. If we add in the, um, extra, the, the 95th and 99th percentile, um, IBM still look pretty good. <laughs> there's, there's, almost nothing, there's almost nothing down there. But you'll see that uh, in the 95th and 99th percentile, there's some pretty extreme outliers there. That scales up to five seconds on the side. So in the case of calls made to this bank from any application built on the Azure data center in the UK, 1% of all calls will have a five second overhead. Um, I've asked Microsoft about that one. Um, Ireland, three seconds. Uh, AWS, in general, has been slower with this particular bank, and I won't name them. Their version of InfoSec 2 is not compliant with how AWS do their DNS registry. But as a separate issue, just when you're thinking about using the public cloud and you're thinking about banks, you can't just rely on a um, CDN or, a, or Akamai or Cloudflare or somebody to do the work for you. They don't always have access to the registry, and those registries are not always kept up to date. 
So it's something to be aware of how slow things can be and what can happen if you have a, a fail and retry situation. I'm going to talk a little more about the content validation side. So we looked at how you can muck around with the numbers on um, how you can muck around with the numbers if you are not returning enough. This is one of the UK banks. Uh, this is the API going from about a quarter of a second to under a tenth of a second per transaction. They were very excited, popped the champagne corks. Our APIs got faster. Nobody bothered to check why. The API stopped returning any data. Um, actually, it was. It was returning one. It was returning the ATMs for Ashby de la Zouche in Leicestershire in England, because uh, it's an A. Um, lasted for a week before anyone noticed. But again, they weren't validating what was coming out of the gateway. They were looking at the return codes and the latency, and that's what they were measuring from. Another one, be careful what you ask for. They've just versioned the OBIE specification. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read this. In the HTTP request, you ask for version 2.2 of the JSON. In the response, it returns the data for 2.1. So while they version the API, they haven't versioned the schema that they're running it behind. Um, interestingly, 50% of the time that actually just fails outright. Um, if you just ask for JSON, which is not in the spec, it works all the time. So again, is this compliant, is this not? This has been referred to the dispute agency, and they're trying to now figure out who, what they should actually do and fix it. Now, my last point is the OBIE have specified terms for availability of an API. I've got a piece of string here because that's a really leading question. It is very hard to work out what availability means in the context of an API transaction. Um, you can't rely on HTTP codes. You need to validate the schema and what's co uh, actually coming back before you know. You need to know what the extreme events are because you can have events that are so slow they may as well have failed anyway. You can have geographic factors where it could be failing from one location and not others. So is that in your availability or is it not? And stack logs can be highly unhelpful. So uh, the best you can often do with availability is, a is essentially a, an estimate of what the uptime is for a particular period of time as a rolling average. <laughs> I don't have an easy solution for that. The formula the OBIE have asked for is quite complex, and it requires you to spot when you go down for whatever value of down you pick from the, the large number of options you have, and then be able to spot when you go back up again, and then estimate how much time elapsed between those two things, and then present that as an actual absolute number to them. Um, it's potentially quite complex and expensive to do. So pulling it together, you have lots of dependencies. There's lots of standards, because I've just talked about the UK. Every other country in Europe has their own versions of this, which if you're a pan-European bank or a TPP, that's a third-party payment provider, or account information service provider, you will have to be aware of and potentially compliant to. And you, what you need to do is measure externally in a consistent way and validate that what you're getting or sending is what you're expecting. So we do this. Uh, we do this for a living. But what we have been shocked at is uh, not just in the banking sector, but in other sectors, there is a strong reliance on either a single tool or a single piece of the stack to answer all these questions for you. Whether it's your gateway logs, whether it's something from New Relic, whether it's um, a web monitoring tool that's been badly adapted to look at APIs. There's a f we get a lot of feedback that they're trying to come up with one thing that will tell them all the answers to those questions. Realistically, the only way to get this data is to pick, uh, is to monitor the metrics you need to monitor externally in the way the regulators are going to need to have them, and then report them in that way. And what we will see, I think, is some very expensive fines and some very expensive problems for people who are relying on just reporting what their stack said and then not being able to prove why they have a dispute with a third party who has external data. So what you need to be able to do is, uh, particularly in the banking sector, is protect yourself from that external threat rather than uh, focus on the internal stuff. So, sorry, there's a lot of information dumped there, but uh, that was uh, a, a quick 
uh, view of um, how bad it can get out there now with banking regulations.